Welcome to the Libertarian Counterpoint. I'm Richard Fields. On the show, Timothy Snowball, attorney at Pacific Legal Foundation, John Cameron, development officer at the Pacific Legal Foundation, and uh, author of Rewire, Rekill, and the upcoming, soon to be issued or published, uh, Aristocracy. Welcome to the show. We're on uh, cable channel 17 in Sacramento, on the web at www.accesssacramento.org at, uh, let's see here, 8 p.m. Thursday, noon Friday, and 4 a.m. Saturday, all Pacific That's time. That's my favorite time. And uh, also on YouTube, and thanks to Timothy, on Facebook. So uh, I think I forgot to say thank you. You we were pointing at him, and, and he, <laughs> uh, Tim volunteered and, yeah. uh, and made the effort. And I think now instead of having seven viewers, we're up to eight. Is that correct? And since we're doing this show on December 7th, mm -hmm. uh, 2017, mm -hmm. you might have a few words to say about this uh, day that will live in infamy. Well, Pearl, Pearl Harbor Day, so it was 73 years ago, I'm trying to do the math, I think that's, that's right, um, was for the generation that self-labeled uh, itself as the greatest generation, the, the day that really changed their world. Um, and I know my... My father uh, was a World War II veteran who was on Anzio Beach, and I think he left much of his soul there. So, um, you know, right? We could talk about the politics and all the rest of it, but I think it's I think it's it's good to just acknowledge the fact that that uh, it's a pretty darn important date in our history, and maybe just kind of uh, pay a little homage to to people who. Um, Many of them, over a million, gave their lives uh, to fight evil on a couple of fronts. And uh, that's really probably all I want to say about it. We should at least acknowledge it. And uh, that was December 7th, uh, 19 whatever, 1940 something. Mm -hmm. uh, today is December 7th, uh, 2017. And on December 8th, 2017, the federal government. Eighth or ninth? Ninth. Well, midnight on the eighth or. Midnight on yeah, the eighth. Yeah, so the. Friday night, midnight, Saturday morning, sometime, uh, the possibility exists that the federal government will shut down. Do we care? Well, I think, uh, well, first of all, will we notice? Um, <laughs> and second, does that mean they'd stop spending money? <laughs> no, it doesn't. Oh, well, in that case, it might be a bad thing. I remember when it, and it bring up my father again, um, the last time it happened, uh, I was coming back from Disneyland, and I drove by the... Um, the Veterans uh, Cemetery, um, I don't remember the name of it, it's about 100 miles south here on, on Highway 5, thinking I'd go see my parents' grave. And uh, since it's, I don't, it's a huge graveyard and I, and I uh, didn't write the information down, the plot number and the line, I thought, well, I'll just, I'll just go to the kiosk and, uh, and look it up. Well, since the government was closed, the cemetery was closed. And instead of leaving the website up and running, and it's an automatic website, they shut it down. Um, just basically to you know punish people who were going to stop by and, and uh, maybe put some flowers down on their uh, on their loved one's grave or remembered person's grave. So so not only will it it uh, it's, they'll actively sabotage uh, our efforts to use these government services that are way, way too costly. And so um, I would love for some big parts of the government to shut down and never start back up again. Well, that's, you're talking about the Washington Monument Syndrome. Mm -hmm. What they'll shut down are the, the national parks and the right. uh, kinds of government programs that people actually like, mm -hmm. uh, but they won't, give, they won't shut down the Defense Department. They won't shut down the uh, checks coming from Social Security and Medicare. They'll, you know, they'll, they'll keep those going because that would raise too much. Too much of an outcry. Mm -hmm. So it's actually, uh, non-discretionary. Yes, yeah, so when, when you're talking <laughs> about the discretionary portion of right. the budget, that's less than a third of the right. budget right there. So two thirds of the of the spending goes on on autopilot, mm -hmm. and one and of the remaining one third, probably well, sixteen percent is federal spe or is uh, defense spending. So le less, you know, probably about half of the discretionary spending. So probably about fifteen twenty percent of the of the spending actually gets affected, but it doesn't really because everybody that's in civil service once they finally do come up with a solution they all get back pay. Back pay, right? For doing nothing, <laughs> in the meantime. Well, and the the condition that the Democrats have attached to whether or not to pass the spending measure 
it would be a provision for the dreamers, isn't that correct? From but the, that's, from yeah, the dreamers, uh, Trump wants his wall, uh, you know, everybody, the, basically the Democrats want more spending on social programs, the Republicans want more spending on uh, defense programs. Nobody wants to pay for it with actual increased taxes or decreased spending elsewhere. So, you know, it, it's, it's, you know, well, it's, interesting it's, it's a kick the can situation, however you right. want to look at it. But for, for libertarians, I've noticed kind of a split um, when it comes for the issue of immigration. I, I knew a lot of people in D.C. who were very much pro-borders and very much, or open borders, and uh, the argument of the added value that uh, immigrants um, have and that add to, to the economy of the country. And then you have um, libertarian wing that's more kind of focused on civil liberties and kind of the free market stuff. So as libertarians, um, although would we say that we're more in line than with the democratic position on this in terms of the value added? We take, we, I, the Libertarians, the Libertarian Party would take the Democratic position and put it on steroids. We would say <laughs> no borders, essentially. We would say that the only, you know, a border is nothing more than a line in the sand driven by dead politicians and bureaucrats. <laughs> many times, in many cases, centuries dead. Mm. There's no reason at all why free trade between John and Juan in San Diego and Tijuana shouldn't take place because of a line in the sand drawn you know, over 100 years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, any more than there's a reason why uh, Richard in Sacramento shouldn't be able to do business with uh, Ricardo in Utah. Well, is there an argument for finite resources, though? I always think about, um, I no. remember a particular lecture from, um, I think it was Milton Friedman, who had said, talking about immigration policy, talking about um, the availability of government programs and the finite nature of, of, uh, of programs like that. So would it, you be entitled then if you do away with this line and you cross into the United States to say apply for a government service? Well, okay, that's a, se a separate question. Should that government service exist in the first place? So I mean, you can ma certainly make the argument that welfare should go first or that uh, immigrants should not be eligible for welfare uh, or social service or social security or Medicare or whatever. That's a, you know, a legitimate argument. But to say that you can't come here because you're the wrong race or the wrong national origin or wrong anything, that's just, that's just unlibertarian. Uh, you know, open borders is what libertarians are, are all about, period. Why? And, and uh, you know, getting rid of, you know, the whole idea of national borders is just nonsense. The, the other thing to think about is that we're all the, all the clean studies show that the the um, the force behind this tremendous idea that we call America, this idea of, of growth and prosperity and bettering yourself and all the rest, is <coughs> driven by generation after generation of immigrants. Mm -hmm. The and people the who come here um, are add much more to the economy than they take from it. Add much more right. in in even with welfare. What's that? Even with even welfare. with welfare. And and here's the thing. Yeah. People are making the, you know, the economic arguments against immigration are just all wet and totally illogical because if an immigrant comes here, they come here to work, they're also going to come here to consume. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a wash. You're, mm -hmm. you're, 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 you're taking jobs, but you're creating jobs because you're also consuming mm -hmm. that creates a job for somebody else. Mm -hmm. So it's a wash. There is and, no, and there is no job loss. There might be a little bit of a rearrangement of the, uh, of the deck shares, but there is no job loss caused by immigrants coming in and taking jobs. They're taking jobs for the most part that Americans don't so, want. So if you have uh, the government shutting down on one side and uh, citizenship rights or recognition, legal recognition being uh, given to the dreamers on the other, <laughs> as a libertarian, what do you do then in this case? Flip, flip, well, flip, I, flip okay. a coin? <laughs> I mean, the whole point, I, I, the, the point of the government shutdown is, is it's, it's just silliness on the part of the two tribes the red states and the blue states, the, the Republicans and the Democrats, arguing over who gets the most access to newly created federal mm. deficits. That's what they're arguing about because there's no there's Ooh. no kitty to to to, to uh, there's no existing uh, tax money to divvy up. They're divvying up, our, our, you know, the, the, the debt idea. of future generations. I have an idea for an amendment to the Constitution that I think might work and fix this up. If you're a congressman and you vote to spend more money without cutting uh, another program to pay for it, 
then you sign a, a, a personal contract. An IOU, that maybe. You will pay it <laughs> out of your own pocket. Good idea. I like yeah. that. Okay. And then, and then reestablish debtors' prisons. <laughs> I like it. So anyway, if the government shuts down work. on Saturday, it'll probably only shut down for a couple of weeks, mm -hmm. uh, and a continuing resolution will eventually, you know, we haven't done a budget for uh, I don't know how long. It'll be a continuing resolution. Things will just go on as they have been, and uh, it's just a mess. Uh, <clears throat> accused of sexual misconduct, the dean of the House, the guy, the longest-serving member of the House of Representatives, John Conyers, uh, finally resigned this week and has endorsed his son to succeed him for his Detroit uh, congressional seat. Of course, a Democrat is going to win in Detroit. That's almost uh, a foregone conclusion. Mm -hmm. The question is, will uh, his son, even with his father's endorsement, be able to win? Because his son has his own domestic abuse arrest record in, in Los Angeles. And anyway, what's a Los Angeles resident doing running in Detroit? Well, um, I don't know. If, since I've sp spoken on this quite a bit, I don't know if I should talk about it, but I will. So you've got uh, a serial adulterer and abuser of women. Um, endorsing his son who has been accused of abusing uh, women and because of where they're running the their party um, is pretty much guaranteed to win so I would say it's just um, I guess the question is will there be a primary contest what's that will there be a primary uh, well I contest? mean why in this case why bother why not just write the guy's name in well, no, no. Why, why will there be a primary against John Conyers III? I, I certainly hope so. Um, some, somewhere this has got to stop. And, I, and I, this is kind of, you know, it's too tangential, so I won't even go there. <laughs> but there's maybe for another show coming soon, talk about the Janus case in the, in the Supreme Court and, uh, and taking away the uh, union's uh, right to uh, demand union dues from non-members and how if if that uh, comes out the way that they predict it's going to change the political landscape in a way that might allow some libertarians to get elected and might allow some people to get elected who are going to balance some budgets. So it, it is far afield for this question, but I think the, the problem with certain areas now is that, that uh, their, the party voting is so ingrained that uh, until the area goes into a death spiral, it's not going to change. And, and I thought for a while that, that uh, Detroit was in a death spiral, but it's, uh, it's kind of doing a, a little bit of a renaissance because you know, housing prices are, are so cheap that people are, are you know, moving from places like California and you know, with- Buying a house, putting it on their credit card and moving in. And, and moving in. And, and, then they're finding a job that will support the mortgage that's like 500 bucks a month and they can do that. And then, you know, it's, it's happened, there are areas of town that have been gentrified that were, you know, basically slums where people moved in and started buying homes and raising families. Maybe it'll happen to Detroit, I don't know. But I'm, it, I, I feel for the people that live in that place if that's the representation they're, they're, they deserve because people get the political representation they deserve and I feel for them. Well, when it comes to constitutional theory and, and possible uh, amendments, I mean, would you all be for, um, you know, term limits? Because, you know, when you read, you read Madison and Hamilton and Jay and the Federalist, and they, they speak of, you know, these citizen politicians who will give of their own time, part-time, to come and serve and, and represent their communities. And I don't know if they ever foresaw um, these positions of uh, career politicians and someone like Conyers. How long did you all say he was? Well, you know, I, I, I don't know if the Libertarian Party has a position on term limits. I'm not sure that it does. My position would be against term limits for one very simple reason. Uh, if you have term limits for two or four or six years or whatever it is, by the time an assemblyman or a senator or a congressman learns where the washroom is, mm -hmm. That's you know it takes them it takes them a while to figure out politicians well, aren't very, it takes them a while to develop so, the expertise and yeah. then they're out. Right. So where does that push the power? It pushes it onto staff, and more importantly, it pushes it onto the bureaucracy, the civil service. Those people never go away, and they're never ever going to go away. They stay there for life, and uh, or retirement at age fifty with a with a with a generous pension. 
the point is the power devolves to the executive if there are term limits on the legislative. And the other side of that is our founding fathers, when they, when they talked about um, the citizen politician and all the rest of that, they couldn't have foreseen the, the amount the of, of, of uh, wealth that these people have to, to dole out mm -hmm. and the power they have and, and how, um, how much value over and above what they're paid the office has. I mean, mm -hmm. they're really like god kings compared to you know, anybody throughout history. They don't pay for transportation, they don't pay for housing, they don't pay for food. They, they command tremendous power because they can give away all the money that this government's printing. So you take away their ability to give away the money the government's printing and they're, they're going to be more accountable. But, you know, until we limit their power. Okay. Oh. Moving, moving to, the, uh, to the local politics, well, local on the East Coast. In Leonia, New Jersey, the town has banned outsiders, anybody who is not a resident of the town, from driving on city streets anytime during morning and afternoon commuter drive time. How, what, what's the justification? How can yes, you do Tim, that? How can they do that? <laughs> it's pretty I'm interesting. Glad you, so, so. you chose to, to, to talk about this. So I, I had not heard about this until I, I looked it up before the show. So it's interesting. So it looks like where the this town is located is right at the um, entryway to the George Washington Bridge, I guess heading, heading into New York, right? And so that you've got a heavy flow of traffic both coming and going from Manhattan. And that people have actually been jumping off the highway, trying to take shortcuts through the city. Oh, trying to get out, get trying away to, from trying the to avoid, trying, trying, to, trying to avoid the right, freeway right, right. traffic. Yeah, and, and I, I think that from what I looked at, this was a relatively small town and kind of a hamlet or whatever. And so uh, it, it is interesting. Uh, the, the article I didn't didn't note what the legal basis would be. This looks to be a, a local municipality passing this ordinance, and it only has an effect. It only has an effect on the local streets. It doesn't have any effect on the actual highway. That passes through the through the town through the mm -hmm. jurisdiction. So I, I I think it's interesting. I I am curious to see what will happen with this and if there's going to be a legal challenge. But on the one hand, um, it goes to local control and and should uh, the people who live in the city be able to limit the traffic coming through for any time the government ever wants to do anything, it's always uh, health safety, health safety and morals and the you know the police power to, to justify doing anything. So whether there's an actual argument for that or whether they're just kind of uh, citing that, as, as governments often do, as an excuse to do this. I'm not sure, but I'm certainly interested to uh, read more up on it and see where it goes. Oh, are they, they generating income from this? Are they writing a lot of tickets? Uh, and that's going to be that I think they had said, yeah, they were going to um, either increase the police force or put extra police on shift to be able to, I guess, do citations. So definitely a revenue well, No, my revenue, understanding revenue is they're, they're going to say, you know, the cops are going to pull people over that they don't recognize and say, you know, unless you're, you've got a good reason to be in this town. Oh, a sticker. They, I think it's a sticker. They, they give you a sticker. Oh, you get whether a Whether or not you're a local. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like, you know, only locals being able to park on certain <laughs> city streets in Davis to the detriment of, of UC Davis uh, students where they, you know, they can't park there. Mm -hmm. Same same principle. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it'll, it'll, it may be legal, but it sure is strange. But this is a strange state. After all, it is New Jersey, and uh, it's New Jersey where the, the governor, uh, uh, still governor, I guess? He's still governor, I guess. For now. Yeah, yeah for now. Chris Christie has, says, has, has uh, he's got a, a case going, I think at the Supreme Court, right? That mm -hmm. Trying to legalize sports betting in New Jersey. He thinks that the state of New Jersey should be able to do sports mm -hmm. betting, which of course would be uh, a, a revenue generator for the state. I'm sure that's uh, Christie's uh, angle on the whole thing. But he's also a drug warrior, you know, in the in the mold of Richard Nixon. He's a, a you know a bona fide drug warrior. So he's consistent. Then. Who thinks that the states should not have the ability to legalize marijuana in New Jersey or anywhere else? Contradiction there on his uh, ideas toward federalism. I need to write down next to that. <laughs> I need to write that word. Um, contradiction. Yes. So uh, I guess the, the way the rules were written, I don't really understand how Nevada got these special rights other than that there are rumors that the mafia might have had something to do with it. Um, I, thought, I don't know if I should have said that on public TV, but anyway. Um, so this is, once again, proves the, the, the um, gross uh, inconsistency 
of politicians of all oaks. In this case, uh, Chris Christie's supposed to be a Republican, I guess, whatever that means. And you would think it, that he would be for, uh, you know, uh, commercial freedom, uh, economic freedom, and all the rest of that. And he is, as long as it's only gambling. But if, um, you know, it's a, it's a, a benign uh, herb or herb, as my English wife says, because it's got an H in it, um, that grows in a ditch somewhere, uh, then the federal government should have the ability to control it. And I, quite frankly, don't understand how uh, you can say that that's a logical thing. Um, my feeling as a libertarian, I, I, I'm guessing you would agree, Richard, is that you should be able to sports bet anywhere you want and buy your pot anywhere you want and take a bet anywhere you want or sell your pot anywhere you want. There's, it's a moral inconsistency, and, and I don't know how Chris Christie can, can you know, look a camera look into the camera and make that statement that, you know, in one case it's a case of federalism and in the other one it's well, a case it's sort of, of it's sort of the It's sort of the Bill Bennett, uh, it's the reverse of the Bill Bennett uh, uh, moral position. Bill Bennett was the, uh, the drug czar under, I think, Reagan or somebody. Mm. And he was, uh, you know, a notorious, uh, still is a notorious anti-pot uh, adv uh, advocate, mm. uh, you know, gateway drug, all of that. Mm. But he's also a high-stakes gambler. <laughs> and... And you know, if gambling is okay, that's his vice. Uh, somebody else's vice, not so okay. Mm. So evidently, Christy is a sports better. Hmm. One would think. Yeah, maybe, well, he bet. He bet. He bet that he would be a strong candidate for the president. While we're, while we're talking States. about marijuana, uh, most like of the marijuana legal or a lot of the marijuana legalization that's going on, particularly medical marijuana, is uh, a, a process that requires. Uh, getting on a register somehow or another. Mm -hmm. I think in California, if you're under the medical medical marijuana laws, you have to register as a, you know, have a doctor's prescription for Let medical marijuana. Let me show marijuana. you what one of the cards looks like, folks. No, I, don't, <laughs> I don't have one. Uh, and, Just uh, kidding. In, in Hawaii, same thing. I, I'm assuming it's medical marijuana. You have to register to be a, me a marijuana user. Yeah. And so people in, you know, the people who are law-abiding citizens of Hawaii have registered to uh, get the right to use marijuana. Once that has taken place, however, the uh, chief of police of Honolulu sent out letters to all of the registered marijuana users saying, you gotta turn in your guns, mm. because that's also registered. You're a registered gun owner, mm. and there's, a, I, I guess, a state law saying that if you're a drug user, you can't have guns. I'm not sure what the legal basis is. So they're placing a condition upon gun ownership of not being able to utilize a medicine that you're prescribed. <laughs> that it would appear, yes. <laughs> yeah, name for me another uh, section of the Bill of Rights, another amendment that can place that kind of condition. I, you know, having, and especially the Supreme Court having stepped in in the last ten years in two major cases and having ruled that the right to keep and bear arms is an individual right, you know, possessed by the individual. I, I find this to be fascinating. <laughs> well, well I'm, I'm, I'm um, empirically. Um, I've <laughs> empirically, I have read an awful lot of stories about people, um, you know, the, doing a little drinking or or uh, and and drink and al alcohol's legal, right? You don't yeah, have to. I wouldn't. Right? Know. You don't have to register yeah. to use. You don't have to register yeah. to use that. And and uh, getting their gun out and going to the local liquor store and putting the gun in the face of the person. I don't. Empirically, I'm not remembering a lot of stories where the pot smoker, who's you know basically got his headphones on, he's raiding right his refrigerator, um, decides to take that gun and and go rob a liquor store. I I think they're actually asking the wrong class of uh, of drug user to turn in their gun. I'm hmm. I'm just thinking that there's there's something wrong with the logic of this here. Hmm. Yeah. Not a whole lot of violent crime being performed by, by folks who are smoking their pot. Well, yeah. you know, the, 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 the postscript is that I think the uh, chief of police of Honolulu has rescinded that letter mm. under uh, public opprobrium mm. uh, as, as the Second as, Amendment. Mm. As she said, <laughs> and, and the Second Amendment. So Wait, what's the amendment that says I'm stupid? Which, that's the one he's yeah. <laughs> should have. Charlestown, Indiana has levied fines for code violations on property owners now, you know, it's not unusual for a city to have codes and to levy uh, code violations whenever those code violations are uh, uh, 
violate it. But in most cases, when you when you violate a code, you're given a, essentially a repair ticket and told mm -hmm. you've got you know a couple of weeks or a couple of months or whatever to fix it up, and then you you avoid the fine. But in Charleston, Indiana, they issue the citation and the fine is due immediately, <laughs> whether you fix it or not. If you don't fix it, uh, well, that's another story. But you have you know you don't have the the choice, and and they're huge fines unless unless you are willing to agree to sell your code in code violation property to a favored developer. Uh, they're trying to uh, redevelop uh, a, a particular area of town without going through all the bother and expense, the huge expense of actually paying people for the property which would be involved in eminent domain. Hmm. Well, that, that Can they do that, Mr. <laughs> Lawyer? I mean, I, I think that um, when you hear people on the left or people who may, um, especially young people, uh, you know, college students and whatnot kind of complain about, oh, capitalism, you know, I don't like capitalism, it's all corrupt and you've got these politicians. What they're actually describing is exactly this kind of situation. You've got kind of this uh, incestuous you know, relationship between the government, you know, demanding, um, uh, you know, they go to a particular provider of services and, and, and forego, um, you know, the opportunity to kind of uh, take advantage of the market. I mean. This is the kind of thing that I think people think of when they're, they believe that they're criticizing a, a, a capitalist system or, or, or whatnot. Um, you know, personally, I mean, <laughs> yeah, nothing surprises me much anymore, but um, this story in particular, I think, is pretty egregious. I, I have a question. Do we know um, the Board of Supervisors in this town? Is there a cousin, perhaps, of, uh, <laughs> uh, that's... Uh, you know, owns the favored development. John Conyers' cousin. Yeah, no. yeah. No, or we, son. No, this is, this yeah. is Indiana, not Michigan. But, yeah. No, I, I don't know. It could be. I, just, I don't know. I, I, I have heard no allegations to that effect, but they're obviously trying to do redevelopment on the cheap uh, and by uh, penalizing the poorest of the poor people who can't afford to, to fix the screen door or whatever mm. they're getting well, a code I'm, violation I'm, for. I'm, I'm pleased to... to, to uh, see from notes or memory or whatever that a judge has stepped in and said that uh, that this is bad you, know, you can't do that so what would be um, the legal basis for preventing it <sighs> I'm not quite common sure. sense yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah I couldn't tell you off the top of my head <laughs> well so I'm well, the eminent domain is 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 part of the Constitution, right? The government. Well, yeah. The government, of if it if it needs for the common good, property of a person. And there's a whole question about whether eminent domain should apply to uh, private developers, but that's a question that we you know, that was settled by Kilo. That's the show. <laughs> we'll see you again next week, same time, same place. I'm a libertarian kind of boy. Thank you very much for being here. Well, thank you for having.